Leah, the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We're a board advisory and mediation practice, helping people thrive and flourish in crisis situations. Believe in crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We want to help people disagree well and move forwards in challenging times. While we are unafraid of crisis, it's rare for one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. That's the genesis of the longest day. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. Today, we welcome Barry Stickings, MBE. Barry worked internationally prior to joining the Met Police, where he worked in uniform across London for 30 years before retiring in 2016. More recently, he has been a seasonal worker for the Border Force, where he deals with aspects of immigration and border entry. In 1989, Barry's son, Toby, was born with an extremely rare genetic disorder called bilateral anophthalmia, meaning he was born without eyes. Barry and his wife, Kelly, later became involved in supporting children with anophthalmia through founding BAM. Barry was awarded his MBE for services to children with visual impairments in 2018. He is a remarkable individual, as is Toby, and his longest day is filled with twists and turns. Well, Barry, thank you so much for being willing to come on The Longest Day. A pleasure. Thank Why? you for inviting me. <laughs> of course. Why don't you tell our listeners about your longest day? My longest day, it was June the 15th, 1989. My wife, Kelly, at the very end of pregnancy. And during the run-up to the 15th, we'd had some issues where uh, Kelly got rushed to King's College Hospital because they had some fears around the baby. And she saw a guy called Kipros Nicolaides, who is a fetal surgeon. He operates on babies in the womb. But he was also doing specialised scans. And I was I was at work. I was actually giving evidence in a courtroom. And I got called. And they stopped the trial. And I got rushed up to King's College, met Kelly, and they did an amniotic fluid test. And as a result of that test, they found that Toby had some kidney issues. So we were fully aware that before Toby was born, he was going to have some, we didn't realise, serious kidney issues. Anyway, June the 15th, 6.30 in the morning, Kelly goes, oh, I think we need to go to the hospital. I went, is it time? She goes, yep, it's time. So the bag's packed, as with every mum and dad. So we head up to our local hospital. We get there. And we sit and wait. And obviously, Kelly's the one who's going through all the pre-birth scenarios, you know, the contractions, the pains um, and everything. And dads are pretty useless at that time. We just sit there and we wait. So I went up to the baker's, got some, got a couple of sausage rolls, as you do. And it was so hot. I just remember it. So, so hot. And then Kelly goes into full labour. And at 2.31 p.m. in the afternoon, so she had a very short labour for a first baby, um, I'm there giving what encouragement you can. Kelly's doing her bit, which I it still knocks me for six, how late is. I don't know. It's just It looks like hell, and it's the pain and the joy, and it's everything together. So all my thoughts, when I, I couldn't care less about myself, everything to me is important for your wife or your partner. That's the important person. And then this baby appears, which is like, the, as every parent will tell you, it's the most emotional thing in your life because you just burst into tears. But they just went, we need to take your baby away. So this, the doctors are dealing with Kelly and, you know, and I'm sort of like thinking, oh, what's going on? He goes, oh, don't worry about it. We're back, back in a minute, going to clean the baby up. And we'll give you the baby. So we had a quick glimpse and that was it. And I just remember saying, his eyes are shut. And they went, yeah, 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 it's all right. We'll clean up and everything. So about 20 minutes. 
and this midwife comes in with a, a look of shock and she walked up and then a doctor came in and they started chatting to both of us and Kelly's still, you know, sort of recovering from the, you know, giving birth, which is a major thing in a lady's life. And they said, we really don't know how to tell you this, but your son has got no eyes. Now, it's like a, it's like a sledgehammer mm. hitting you. And we just looked at each other and obviously got very upset. And they've given us Toby, who's this tiny little wiggling, screaming little person. And you're sort of thinking, well, what do we do with the baby? And uh, But I looked at him and I said, well, he's got eyelids and eyelashes. And they goes, yeah, but there's no actual uh, eye formed in the socket. So we sort of had to take all this in. And they had never seen this before. And the condition was called bilateral anophthalmia or anophthalmus. So, and we said, what about the issue with the kidneys? And they said, well, we're aware of that, so we're on the case for that. And then they put Kelly in a, in a, wall, in a room on her own, away from all the other parents. And I thought that was really quite harsh to do that because it's like saying we just put you aside because we've got all these mums with their babies we don't want them to be aware of so anyway the next few days you know is quite intensive but one of the things that was the hardest to do was the fact that Kelly you know 33 years ago mobile phones weren't really that around not everybody had them in fact not a lot of people had them so it was agreed between us both that I would have to go and tell everybody so I had to go around Kelly's mum and dad my dad um and then get in touch with my sisters and obviously friends etc etc and that was pretty hard to actually have to do that but it needed to be done. And then we're back at the hospital and it was it was quite hard trying to think what's the next step. But the priority was Toby and Kelly. I didn't matter. Toby and Kelly, they're the ones. They were important. Kelly's given birth. Toby's now our new little person in our life. And, the, and a, a beautiful little son. Beautiful little son. So... Then it was decided that he needed to go to Great Ormond Street because of his kidneys, because they were a real issue. So three, I think it was three or four days later, um, Kelly was taken up <clears throat> in an ambulance up to Great Ormond Street. We had nurses go with us, etc. And Toby spent months in Great Ormond Street having pretty major surgery on his kidneys, which, touch wood, the guy who did the surgery, it was a very unique piece of surgery. Um, yeah, it resolved the issue. But but just getting back to the day of the birth, it was like, wow, what, what do we do? But we're very positive people. And you sort of think, we have our child. We can't change our child. So we just accept and that is quite an important thing to do, that you accept. You don't. I mean, because you, you could regress, couldn't you? You could go back and you could say, oh, woe is me. And oh, dear. But everybody was brilliant because seeing us being positive made everybody feel a little bit better because we said, we've got our son, Toby. Yes, he's been born blind. He's been born with no eyes. Um so we just need to get on with life, and he's the priority. It's an exceptionally overwhelming, difficult, scary situation that you and Kelly found yourself in. Absolutely. And the positivity and the resourcefulness and the dedication and everything that you've done to give Toby such a phenomenal 
life. Oh, he's, um, he's, he's having a great life still. <laughs> it never ends. <laughs> but I can't assume that that shift from trauma and grief and loss and fear to positivity was instantaneous. Oh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't instantaneous. It was something that came over a few days. I think really what spurred us was the kidney condition was life-threatening. No two ways about it. So our, our focus was on that, and the blindness was going to be another aspect. But you just sort of think, I can't do anything about this. There is that strange analogy that I'm sure lots of people have used. You get on your plane, you've got your summer clothes, and the plane goes to the wrong place, and you end up in Helsinki in the middle of the winter when you're meant to be in the Caribbean. What can you do about it? Not a lot. So you adapt and you... But I think what was good was we had good family support, good friend support, but good medical support. And we were lucky. We had top experts dealing with Toby's kidney condition and the eye condition. And that, I think, is what sort of spurs you on. But we're positive people anyway mm. because, you know, you just sort of think to yourself, oh, well, that's happened. Mm. Can't do anything about it. Get on with it. But you're not just a positive person. You're somebody who has experienced a huge amount of longest days professionally in, in other forums. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the things that have helped you to adopt this outlook on life? <sighs> I think it's the way you're born. I think it's in you that, you know, you just accept. Because, you know, as people, we, we, we do have the power to change, but we don't have the absolute power to change. And in Toby's instance, we knew from minute one that boy was never going to see. So, and I think that's the way you do it. But what you do is you adapt to give them the best that you can give to make their life as – I mean, it's a shame Toby's not here because he's more positive than us. You know, he but his phrase is, um, being blind is not my problem, it's other people's. And he's stuck with that since he was a young kid. That He said that one day and we were like, whoa, where'd that come from? Mm. But you can't change it. You know, if it, if it, if it was us – and all of a sudden, God forbid, we lost our sight, that's a quite a scary scenario because we have to totally change the whole way our life functions. And that's – but you have to do it. And I, I just think, that, you know, all right, it's been tough. We've had tough times. You know, it's been tough where, you know, we thought, oh, dear. But I think having that bright little spark of a boy kept us – you know, keeps you going – and, you know, that, that's what we did and that's what we do. And we still do it now, you know. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Centre, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organisations in Thanet, Kent and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. Tell me about how some of those premature experiences, even in the hospital with how doctors siloed you from other patients, how, how that has fed into the work that you've done advocating for people with Toby's condition? Um, I think w w what it's done is it's made us understand that what you are given is what you are given. Um, others will react very differently. You know, doctors, nurses, even though it is their job, sometimes I don't always think professionals react correctly but then again if they have no knowledge of a situation how can they react to something they don't really understand because they're learning and, and, and those staff it was a shock and we could see it on their faces but what, what it did for us was over the years 
and y- you just sort of think to yourself, well, oh, blimey, what should we do today with him? And you think, well, we'll go out with and I've took him out on a little plane and that, yeah, just silly little thing, but because he has to have life experience. And then later when um, there was an, an article in the Observer newspaper going back a very long time, um, and it was all about a family. I won't mention names because that wouldn't be correct, but they had a child who had the same condition as Toby. And the Observer did an article, and I read it, and I went, wow, this, this is interesting, because we had not really met many people who kids had bilateral, or BA as we call it. And then the, at the bottom of this article, it said, we would like to get families together. And they did. We went to a big meeting with Lord Ashley, uh, some other politicians, and they just said, because the article dealt on another aspect of what may have caused it, uh, which I won't go into. Um, But they brought together a group of families. So those families all went, we need to do something here because there is no support. So there was two parents that the article was about, and they sort of grabbed it by the horns with some other lovely mums and dads, and eventually they formed a support group, which at the time was called the Micro and Anophthalmic Children's Society, and that incorporated anophthalmia, microanophthalmia, which is the small eyes, and coloboma, which is the teardrop like. Madeline Kahn had. Um, and then over the years, it just developed, and I thought I'd quite like to get involved. So I got involved and ended up as the chairman for nine years. Voluntary trustees, all voluntary parents, just wanting to do good. And one of the, the highlights of that was... We used to have a family weekend, loads of that, 90 plus families, something's over 100, go away, four days, all organised by parents, big hotel up north, four days, mayhem, but get together. And this family walked in and they're still really, in fact, we're seeing them soon, two really good friends of ours, and they won't mind me mentioning Phil and Mary with a little baby in their arms called Owen. And Darwin was there, clearly bilateral and found me. So my wife went up and said, go to the bar, have a drink, give us your baby. So off Kelly went, walking around the hall, this is Owen, he's a new baby, saying hello. And we went round and round and round. And that's what she did. And they're now, they've been friends of ours, 20 odd years. So that is another form of being positive because you're saying, Yes, this child's got a condition, but does it matter? Still a lovely little child. And that was it, going around. And then the group just, and I, my whole thing about, I never wanted anybody to say thank you to me or any of the other trustees because everybody was hard working. But my whole thing was, if one, per, one person just went, thank you, job done. Don't have to do anything else. And we had we had tough times in, in you know in the charity. You know, we lost a couple of children. But everybody was there. And what was great, you see people who'd never met anybody else just sitting down together and chatting. And going, Oh yeah, what'd you do when you what do you do? And it's all silly questions, mm. but they're questions. And it just grew and it grew and it grew. You know, we, we took blind kids and threw them out, threw them out of aeroplanes, you know, because we said, go enjoy yourself, much as they didn't want to jump. Um, we did sailing. All the kids went on specially equipped boats. They could go sailing once from England to Spain, or was it Spain to England? But anyway, we did a quite a big journey. And, you know, it, but it was all about the group. And the ideas that the trustees would bring in and the ideas we would get from the families. So everybody's attitude was positive. And, and I think we all rubbed off on each other because I think that's a very important way to be. Um, and then I 
that I retired from my job in the police in 2016. And I, I left the charity. I'm still a member, but I, I then left. So because it was time to move on. It strikes me that it's not just positivity, but there's a huge amount of kindness and selflessness with time and energy. How do you cultivate those character traits other than leading by example? That, it's me. That's just me. You know, if one of my mates rang up now and said, oh, something's happened, can you help? I'll go. You know, because I, I just think that we, it doesn't hurt to help other people. I think it's quite important to help other people. You know, even when when I was in the police, and I, I did a, a vast amount of roles in the police, um, but at, the bottom line was you were there as a police officer to help people. And I had some amazing experiences of helping people. Mm. I had some pretty awful experiences. And I had some experiences which I'd never want to have again. And I had experiences that absolutely knocked me down. You know, I, I was at pretty low points, especially with one. Um, and I still remember that now. But I think at the, you know, at the end of the day, the bottom line is it doesn't cost anything to help anybody, does it? It doesn't cost anything. It costs you your time. Mm. I mean, just to, to divulge, I belong to a police association. And they've recently started this thing called befriending people who've retired and are now older. So I thought that'd be good. I'll have some of that. So two weeks ago, I get a message. You live in Broadstairs? I went, yeah. He goes, well, we've got this guy. He's the next Metropolitan Police Officer. He's 102. And I was like, 102. <laughs> so I was like, wow, where did this come from? And he goes, would you be happy to go and meet him? I said, absolutely. Three minutes up the road. No. I could walk there. I didn't even know he lived there. And I went and sat with him. And we're from two different eras of policing, but our jobs were very similar at the, you know, for what we did. We did basically the same, you know. But it was just like sitting there and I'm thinking, he retired in, in the 70s. <laughs> but what a lovely man. So so now I'm in touch with him. And it's quite nice, actually, you go around there. I don't think the whiskey at 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock was a good eye. You know, it got offered. But I said, no, 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 I'm fine. You, you carry on. But he, um, really lovely, lovely man. And, and I put it out there just to say that I'm doing this uh, on a, one of our police Facebook pages. They went, oh. God. And they went, the greatest of respect for that man. And I said, absolutely. So that's another form of just thinking, you know, got time, go and do something, go and help somebody. It doesn't hurt, does it? Mm. It doesn't hurt at all. What have you learned about yourself through, I suppose, the personal trials alongside the professional trials? Um, I think my biggest trait is my wife says this. Sometimes I don't listen. It's because you like saying your own voice. Um, but I do, I do listen. But I do understand what, what she sort of says to me. I can be quite quick to push my idea, which may not be the best idea, but I also can listen to other people, which I think is important. Um in the charity wise, we had so many ideas. We had a team and like all of us had ideas. But eventually you all listen, don't you? And I eventually I, I do listen. Mm. And even at my age now, you learn. Mm. So I, I think but I think I, I just I just enjoy life and I will never I don't walk by people if they say hello especially down here, because everybody says we can't even go for a walk, for a 20-minute walk, because we end up... It takes half an hour to get five minutes half down an hour, the road. It? Yeah, you can't get anywhere. But And that's partly because of everybody knowing Toby, because he, he stands out. Um, 
But I think really at the end of the day, it's, you know, if I've done something wrong, I will always say I'm sorry and I shouldn't have done that. Mm. So I do know my thoughts. I do know my thoughts. And just, I suppose, linking that to your longest day, is there anything, as you and Kelly have looked back, that you wish that you'd done differently? No. No, I don't think there was, I don't think there was anything we could do different because, you know, it's a scenario that many, many parents have been through across the world when they have a child who's born with their eyes. Some cannot accept it. Mm. They cannot accept what's happened. And that's why I think support groups are good. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started a support group purely now for that condition. Mm -hmm. And it covers the world. Um, because I, I just think our experiences are positive. Other parents, positive. We have parents who join and they join the group. I mean, the, the, the group's called BAM, which was, you know, we had to think about, I think, for like Kelly and I were going, oh, what should we call it? And then thought, yeah, bam, B-A, what should we do? And we went, oh, that'd be good. Bam, we like that. So and that's what it become. Mm. So it's called bilateral anophthalmia and me because that brings the parent or the friend in because you have the person who has the condition, so that could be and me, right. or it can also be mum, dad, brother, sister. And that's what's important is that um, they all understand that support is there because families get affected. Yeah. And I think through posting, and it's great because we get so many people who post really positive stories. And I, I used to go and I went out to America a couple of times to give some talks. When I was in the old charity, I went out to Boston and Los Angeles and met the groups in America, which are huge. Because this condition's vast. But when you talk to people and you meet the kid, God, you meet meet the kids. They're great. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that make you positive. Yeah. Because you look at them and you think, oh, you know, they, their life's going to be different. Can't odds it. It's going to be different. But when you get kids who come up and they go, oh, I'm doing this and I was riding my bike, but I fell off. And you think, fair enough, giving it a go. So, you know, it's all things like that. You know, Toby's a very positive role model. He's a gamer, and people still cannot understand how he plays games. He loves walking. He loves going. I mean, he loves traveling. You know, we've taken him every corner of the world. Um, and he just loves life. Yeah. And that, I think, is the most important thing. So if he loves life and he's happy, I'm happy, Kelly's happy, and – that's that's how life should be and i think just getting back to your point about that the longest day i mean that was a long day mm -hmm. because you know i went home that evening on my own and just sat there and thought wow where is our future going to be but our future's been brilliant mm -hmm. you know we're living it now and just the fact that you can you can look back on what was it was a traumatic day. You know, for Kelly, she had to give birth. For me, standing there as the dad, and we're sort of like that, that just that person who's there. And, you know, we, 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 we do encouragement and everything else, but we, a man would never understand what a lady goes through giving birth. And so then when the baby's born, everything just all changes instantly because the baby's there. Yeah. And for us beautiful baby boy but then a scenario developed where it changed our lives but it also just in some respects we've done things that we probably would never have done i'd rather toby can see 100 percent. but then if you ask him he goes not bothered so he it doesn't worry him but i just think we've done things we've met amazing people amazing people um, I mean, Toby loves the theatre. Loves Les Mis. God, loves Les Mis. Who, who wouldn't love Les Mis? It's oh, one of my personal favourites. Well, he, he made Alfie Bow and Matt Lucas cry. So, and they both said to him after the show, you made us cry. But 
but a lot some people I think they oversee the blindness see the person and I think that's quite an important thing and I think now hopefully staff when children are born with this condition they they understand yeah and I'm pretty sure they do knowing the amount of medical people I know now and they're quite positive about the whole thing yeah so I think it's quite nice now you mentioned on your longest day that you went for a sausage roll run I did if you had to live your longest day again what food would you choose to get through it Sounds terrible, this. Ice cream. Love ice cream. <laughs> Is that bad? Not bad. Not bad. All ice cream, any ice cream, Italian ice cream, all sorbet. Ice cream. What, all, ice cream. all ice cream. All ice cream, yeah. Yeah, I could do ice cream. Yeah, ice cream, yeah. Yeah, I think ice cream would be good, even in the winter. Even in, in the, the winter. winter. Well, we've got, you know, we've got a place Morelli's in Brawlstairs. Morelli's all year round. Morelli's all year round, yeah. In fact, when all my friends come down here, all us old roughy tufty old retired coppers, where do we go? And we're out to have a drink and have a day out together. We'll go to Morelli's and have a coffee and a big ice cream. There's so, nothing like it. Ice cream. I think Leah is the one ice cream. Yeah, we go for ice cream. Yeah, which isn't a bad thing, is it? Never a bad thing. Never a bad thing. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for sharing about BAM and Toby and Kelly and your experiences and the Police Association and no, it's, your it's... new friend at Befriended. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he's he's a character. But uh, c could I just say one last thing? Of course. If this gets heard by any parents who've got a child with the condition, you know, the bilateral anophthalmia, please just look us up. Um because I've got a fantastic network of people who've joined. They're all families, and they're, they're in Australia, they're in Iraq, they're in Syria, they're in Africa, they're in the Caribbean, they're in America. They are all over the world, and just by having one person that you could talk to who may live, like me, with my old mate who lives three minutes away, you could have somebody in your village or your town that you never knew about. That's what it's about. Get together and help. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Leo. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next instalment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. <laughs>